So good evening, everyone, and welcome to the New York Historical Society. I'm Louise Mirror, New York Historical's president and CEO. And it really is a great pleasure for me to see all of you this evening in our beautiful Robert H. Smith Auditorium. We are thrilled to welcome David M. Rubenstein back to New York Historical as moderator for this evening's program. Tonight's History with David M. Rubenstein program focuses on the Vietnam War. Mr. Rubenstein is the chairman of the Smithsonian Board of Regents. He added that job in, November, in October 2016, making a wonderful comment that I'm delighted to repeat tonight. I love the museums, he said, and I love the learning. It keeps me young. We are also delighted to welcome Ken Burns to the New York Historical Society this evening. Uh, Mr. Burns has been making documentary films for almost 40 years. Since the Academy Award uh, nominated Brooklyn Bridge in 1981, he has gone on to direct and produce some of the most acclaimed historical documentaries ever. His films have been honored with dozens of major awards, including 15 Emmy Awards, two Grammy Awards, two Oscar nominations, and our very own New York Historical History Makers Award in 2016. And now, please join me in welcoming our guests. Thank you. Thank you. So, um, well, Ken, I guess I feel obliged to ask you, are you considering running for president? <laughs> no, definitely not. Okay. I, I feel like I, are, I have the best job in the country. Okay. So, um, many people, you, we are roughly the same age, the same generation. Many people in our generation wanted to go to law school or maybe medical school or something like that. Um, when you told your family you wanted to be a documentary historian, what did they say? Well, I think part of the reason why I arrived at that is that there wasn't much of that family left. And my mother had died of a 10-year battle of cancer when I was 11. You can imagine, I imagine how demoralized the, the family was. My father was a cultural anthropologist, and I'm not that far off azimuth from that. But what I do for a living is wake the dead. And uh, I had a, my, my late father-in-law was a psychologist who pointed this out to me at age 40, uh, that uh, I had some unresolved business trying to, with my mother that needed to, to be resolved. And so we've been waking the dead for 40 years. All right, so how did you, act? you went to college, what did you study in college? I studied filmmaking. Almost every course I could take was in filmmaking or film history or photography at Hampshire College in Amherst, Massachusetts. It opened in the fall of 70, it opened in the fall of 70, I came in the fall of 71. It was kind of new experimental for that time, uh, undergraduate education, more like graduate school, and it permitted us to really dive deep into a particular area of expertise. So when you graduated, what did you do? You just don't get a job that easily in no, filmmaking. No, you don't. And I, I think that, that my naivete, my overwhelming naivete helped because I graduated in the spring of 1975 and started a company called Florentine Films with two of my schoolmates, Roger Sherman and Buddy Squires, whom I still work with to this day. And we've never had other bosses. Uh, we've been making films uh, about, I've been particularly focused in American history. All the films I've done have been in American history. Um, for public television, almost from the very So you've never moment. had a boss? Never had a boss. Well, you're not missing anything. No, <laughs> I, I, I understand. I, I can tell because I am, in fact, the boss to a uh, you know, relatively small group of okay. several dozen people, and I understand what being so a boss is. So what was is. your first film? So I made a film at uh, Hampshire College, which is sort of a senior thesis called Working in Rural New England for Old Sturbridge Village. The one that really matters uh, that Louise was mentioning was the first film for public broadcasting, uh, which I finished in 1981. It was broadcast in 82 called Brooklyn Bridge. Uh, the Brooklyn Bridge was about to turn uh, 100 the following year in 1983, and I had spent five years of my life when I looked about 12 years old trying to sell people uh, the Brooklyn Bridge. Uh, you know, I spent a lot of my time with the tin uh, cup out, and in that days it was raising $1,000 from the New York Doc Railway or $2,500 from Abraham and Strauss, a department store, and I was actually handed an envelope. It didn't have cash. I wish I could tell you it had cash in it. On the second floor walk up on Montague Street in downtown Brooklyn by Meet Esposito, uh, the head of the Kings County Democratic Party, who thought if any film was going to be made, as he put it, about his bridge, he ought to have some skin in the game. And of course, as everyone in this room knows, Meet Esposito died in jail. So, um, all right, after that, you then did what 
Which film next? I did a history of the Shakers called Hands to Work and Hearts to God, then a biography of Huey Long, then a history of the, how the Statue of Liberty got built, and then uh, started work on the Civil War then. I did a couple of other films on the Congress and Thomas Hart Benton while I was spending the five and a half years working on the Civil War. Remind so, people, on the Civil War, how long ago was that? That came out in the fall of 1970, so a long time ago. So it's people forget years. it. How many years? 28 years 20 years ago. Fall. 28 yeah. years, so yeah. it seems like not that long ago. No, and you know, the, the wonderful thing is that it's, um, today is a school day in the United States and PBS estimates that many hundreds, some, maybe even thousands of classrooms are looking at some of the Civil War today as they did yesterday and will do tomorrow. And it took you five and a half years to do that? And where'd you get the money for it? How much did it cost? So that, the budget for the Civil War was about $3.6 million. Uh, it came from General Motors, the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, uh, uh, the Pew, uh, no, the Arthur Vining Davis Foundations and the MacArthur Foundation and the National Endowment for the Humanities who gave the largest grant of $1,449,500, which I repaid with program income within a year. And no one's ever done that in the history of the National Endowment of the Humanities. No money from Mead Esposito, right? And no one. money from Mead Esposito for that film, right? And how many people watched it? Um, PBS estimates that 40 million people watched some or all of the series when it was first shown, which is still uh, the highest rated program in PBS history. And uh, just to remind uh, people, um, th in those days there were um, uh, not as many, um, I guess, social media kinds of things. So Nothing. So it was basically broadcast on how many consecutive nights was it? So it was five nights, there were nine episodes, but we stacked the first night was the first episode and the subsequent four nights right. had two different episodes and we finished with the ninth and uh, the, on a Thursday night. The and music just, was quite lyrical. How did you pick that music and where would, where would the music ideas come well, from? In all of the films that I had done before and all the films I've done subsequently, I've, I've let the material sort of dictate what the music, the period, first of all. And so I had recorded um, with a guy that I know. Uh, he, I'd had him play on, on a piano all these hymns and popular songs from the era and of course the martial music and, and the songs that the soldiers sang. And I picked out 30 or 40 and then went into a studio before we started editing and recorded um, 40 or 50 different versions of each of those 40 or 50 different songs. But one of my session musicians was a violinist who lives in West Hurley, New York named Jay Unger. And he had written, a Jewish boy from the Bronx, he had written the most beautiful Scotch-Irish lament in 1983 called the Ashokan Farewell. The Ashokan, is, there's a reservoir that's part of the network of reservoirs that uh, uh, satisfy our thirsts in the city. And uh, he sat down after a music camp that he ran and wrote this beautiful thing. And I realized that that was the bridge uh, to the moment. So every other piece of music is of the period of the Civil War, played with contemporary instruments, except this one that kind of helped us uh, and I tell you today, David, it's probably been pay played a thousand times at a wedding or a funeral or a memorial service or a renewal of vows or something. So such. once that uh, became public, the Civil War series, you became relatively well known. And what became uh, something that people were interested in, I'd like to ask you about, is your hairdo. Oh, yeah. Um, <laughs> where, where did you get that hairdo? Um, and where, what's the story about that? It grows, actually. Right. Um, <laughs> What's well, so better than the opposite? I, I grew up in, I, in Ann Arbor, Michigan, partly during the 1960s, and I had hair a hell of a lot longer than this. And uh, sometime in the 70s, I just had it cut off by this young woman at a, at a, at a hair salon in Amherst, Massachusetts, and she wanted to go very slowly, and I said, no, 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 and she did sort of about basically this, a little bit shorter, and then... Um, it grows out and I can't see anymore, which is gonna be in about a week and a half. And then I kind of go mow the lawn and then I go back and I've been- She's just, still cutting your hair? And the same person, she's like a grandmother, she's retired, I have to go to her house now. And, <laughs> and she still cuts the hair. I'm oh. very, very loyal. I mean, I, my, I'm still using the same cinematographer that I started working with in 1973 or four. Uh, my writer, principal writer, Jeffrey Ward, I've been working with since the early 80s. Is her 80s. rate for cutting your hair gone up? Uh, no, it's actually, I tip her heavily, uh, and um, it's, not, it's not Clintonian in its okay. uh, excess. So let's talk, let's talk about the Vietnam War uh, uh, series you've now done. Um, how long did it take you to, to do this? Well, if you take from the moment that I said yes to the project, which is just an internal pr 
thing. It was almost 11 years, 10 and a half, more than 10 and a half years. Um, but of course, the first several years are trying to sort of master a little bit about the subject yourself. I've never done a film about something I've known about. You know, if you do that, then you're basically telling people what they should know rather than that's called homework. How do you do that? You read books? I read books. We talk to scholars. We begin to think ourselves about how we do it. We look at art. We come to archives like this. I mean, I love the New York Historical Society from the very first film that I've done. It's been a, a resource along with, in the Civil War, 162 other sources. So we're traveling around the country, or in the case of Vietnam, around the world. We're trying to get a sense of it. We're looking for access. We're trying to figure out ways of approaching it. And what's important to understand about the the Vietnam War is that we have learned so much since the fall of Saigon. There has been so much new scholarship that it has turned conventional wisdom that we, those of us who might have even been there or thought we knew about it because we protested it or certainly was al alive and followed it on the nightly news, it, almost everything is turned upside down. And so I think it took us two or three years just to get some sea legs to be, uh, begin to say, let's start. Let's start interviewing. Let's ask intelligent questions. How much did it cost? $30 million. And where that money come from? It came from a variety of sources. We had a corporate sponsor, uh, no longer General Motors. It has been for the last uh, many years, and they've thank goodness, signed up until 2030, uh, Bank of America. That's about a quarter we get from large institutional foundations like the Pew Charitable Trusts and Arthur Vining Davis Foundations, another quarter uh, from uh, the government sources like the National Endowment for the Humanities, but mostly the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and PBS itself. It isn't the government, but um, it's people like you, thank you. Um, and, and then I started after the 08 meltdown and uh, a group called the Better Angels Society who are here, many people who are here today that are individuals of wealth and small private family foundations who sort of made up, picked up the slack. And um, that's how we've done it. It's incredible, still to this day, incredibly labor intensive. So the shooting of it took how long? Actual well, filming you know, we don't have the shooting days that Hollywood would say, well, we shot for 76 days in these 10 locations. We will shoot over many, many years, but we'll also be writing, we'll also be editing, we'll further research. Even when the film was done and we, as it's called, locked it in, uh, in, and no one believes this because of the similarities and the echoes with the present political circumstance, that we finished the film in 2015 and then spent a year and a half doing the, the post-production work and were able to continue to check the facts and the dates and the numbers and change them as, as necessary oh. so that it reflects what I think is the probably, the uh, at least for a while, an uh, aggregation of, of the central understanding of the Vietnam War among scholars and, and most importantly, the people who were there or the people who protested it. As a result of your research, what would you say is the biggest surprise that you to you and the surprise that you expect people will see in the movie? Right? Well, you know, for me, uh, having grown up in a college town, having sort of been come aware as a, as a human being with the Vietnam War, I thought I knew a lot. And so I think the biggest feeling was the sense of humiliation that I knew nothing about it. And that was daily. And after a while, you, you welcomed the unknowing. You welcomed taking a scene that was working and realizing that you had to make it more complicated. But I think for the for just the point of view of um, conversation, just the extent to which Truman and Eisenhower and Kennedy and Johnson and Nixon all knew that this was never, ever going to work and nonetheless plowed into it. And the other thing is that we, pre we thought we knew a little bit about our enemy and we could ask most of the people in this audience who was running North Vietnam, and everyone would say Ho Chi Minh, but in point of fact, as our series in episode one pointed out, by 1959, and that's not a typo, he was marginalized and not the determining voice on the Politburo. It was another person named Les Zuan who was calling the shots, who designed the Tet Offensive when uh, General uh, Vo Nguyen Zop, we say GAP in this country, died a few years ago at 104. The New York Times, in a very fulsome and appropriate front page to full page obituary, this hero of Dien Bien Phu gave him credit for um, the Tet Offensive, when in fact he so opposed the Tet Offensive, as did Ho, that Zop's entire staff was arrested and he was sent to Hungary for medical treatment. So I mean, there was some basic fundamental tenets that began to sort of crumble as we began to research and we realized that we had to forget everything and sort of begin anew and complement 
all the testimony of Americans, both for and against the war, and all the stripes in between, with North Vietnamese voices and South Vietnamese voices. So military as well as civilian. So the main message you would want somebody who would watch the entire, all of the shows, uh, to take away about uh, the Vietnam is what? It's complicated. <laughs> no, I mean, I, literally, we, we sort of felt all the way through that, uh, you know, I, I keep going back to something that I, I'm sure I bored you to death and all the times we've had conversations, David, but I, when I was making my jazz film in the 90s, I was speaking with Wynton Marsalis and he was talking about something else entirely. But he said, sometimes a thing and the opposite of a thing is true at the same time. And that was a huge eye-opener for me. And I think it's true of, of art, what art is able to do, unlike a political dialectic which is binary, art is able to understand the shadows that are present as well. So it means that heroes aren't uniformly good, that villains aren't uniformly bad. We sort of get that, that people have flaws and heroism is itself a negotiation between flaws and strengths within a person. But I think in a larger sense, it permitted us to understand that we would better triangulate an almost unknowable phenomenon by hearing from all the different voices than by regurgitating kind of conventional wisdom or what the wisdom was that we'd arrived at today. And we found almost every thing that we found to be true in one perspective looked a lot different when you were talking to a South Vietnamese civilian as opposed to an American civilian. And then again, another view from a North Vietnamese civilian. And to review, I'd remind everybody, how many American soldiers were killed in Vietnam? A uh, little bit over 58,000. There are several different numbers, and a lot of it has to do with how different groups, including the Department of Defense, cap uh, counts them. And at any given week, what was the highest number of people being killed? I think the worst, the apogee, was in the spring of 68, and there were nearly 3,000 killed in a week. In a week? Yeah. And how many injured, not killed? So you've got, usually it's multiples of 10 and 20s, uh, depending on the, the type and scope of battle, and that fluctuates widely. Okay, let's go back through the history uh, of Vietnam. So um, in 1954, the Yen Bien Phu Falls, and the Vietnam Vietnamese kind of kick out the French. So Eisenhower is president. Does Eisenhower want to do anything about that? No, he, we, by that time, by t the time of Dien Bien Phu, we were paying almost 80% of the French military budget. The American people had no idea of this. And this had been part of the strategy of first Truman and then Eisenhower. And when there was uh, entreaties to intervene militarily at Dien Bien Phu, <clears throat> the general in, in Eisenhower and the politician in Eisenhower knew it was foolhardy continue to support it. This was a battle that took place in advance of the Geneva uh, meetings that would decide Vietnamese fate and Vietnam's fate, and both sides wanted to sort of secure their position. So the battle happened. It was a, ter a terrible defeat for the French, and it, it essentially uh, ended in the Geneva Accords that divided Vietnam at the 17th parallel, with the stipulation that in two years, in 56, there would be an election, which not a single person who was breathing on earth and was sentient knew would, would, wouldn't be won by anyone else but uh, Ho Chi Minh. So when Eisenhower met with Kennedy, when, after Kennedy was elected, before Kennedy assumed office, did Eisenhower talk to Kennedy about Vietnam, what he should do with it? Actually, Eisenhower was more interested in Kennedy uh, intervening in a communist insurgency in Laos, which Kennedy turned him down on. And then Kennedy almost immediately stepped in it with the Bay of Pigs. He then went to Vienna and was sort of humiliated uh, by Khrushchev there, and then couldn't keep the Soviets from building the Berlin Wall. And so he, he spoke frankly to aides, saying, if we don't draw the line in the sand in South Vietnam, our chances of re-election. And, and Kennedy, who finds himself right smack in the middle of the history that we tell, um, is like every other president, both before and after, is the, the principal important decisions about Vietnam are made based on domestic political consideration, which is, will I get re-elected? And uh, when Kennedy assumed office, how many Americans were advisors in Vietnam? Somewhere between 16 and 17,000 advisors. He'd inherited about 700 from Ike. And then he, he had understood this new evolving strategy issuing out of not just the cataclysm of World War II, but the nuclear age that that ushered in, that you weren't going to fight World War III, you were going to fight proxy wars, or what he called limited wars against insurgencies. And he would do it in different places, and Vietnam was where he was going to really commit. So how many people then, how many American advisors? But then? when he was killed in Dallas, there were almost 17,000. 17,000 then, but initially when he came in. It was about 700. 700. 
So um, the, the ruling le leader and president of South Vietnam was... Uh, no Ding Ziem, uh, until uh, three, he was assassinated by a coup the, three weeks before Kennedy was killed. And did Kennedy support the assassination? He did, in a, in a way that he came to regret. Uh, there had been, uh, his administration was very torn, as every administration had been about what to do about Vietnam, and there are many people who said, just get out of there now. There's no good, Dien Bien Phu should have showed us that you know the bridge is out two miles don't crash through this barrier. Uh, but uh, the, the Hawks won the day, and he tacitly, while he was on vacation in Hyannisport, approved uh, a cable that sent, was sent out by a deputy assistant secretary of state named Roger Hillsman that essentially gave the nod to the coup planners. There was still another month or two of debate within the administration until finally they did say to the generals who had decided to overthrow the increasingly autocratic No Ding Ziem, and he was uh, overthrown, took sanctuary in a Catholic church. He was a Catholic. But Kennedy was surprised that Diem was assassinated. And then he was, they were promised his pass, passage, Ziem and his brother knew, who was a very strange man, and they were both assassinated. So, uh, all right, so he's surprised Diem is assassinated, and he's assassinated himself three, three uh, uh, weeks later. Uh, many people who have written about Kennedy after he died, people who worked in the administration, said that secretly Kennedy had told them that after he was reelected, he was going to pull out of Vietnam. Is there any evidence of that? I didn't find any, and we certainly would have done that. And we're not in the what if business; we're in the what happened business. And it's always great to quarterback or, or you know, say, "Gee, if we pulled our pitcher in the sixth inning until the seventh, we would have won that game." Well, that may be true, but that's not what happened. And so. Um, he, the, the man who took over from uh, John F. Kennedy was Lyndon Baines Johnson of Texas, and he had an ambitious domestic agenda. He wanted to be the reincarnation of FDR, and um, he did a pretty good job of, of doing that despite Vietnam, but he understood that his overwhelming weakness was foreign policy, and he said, foreigners aren't like the people I know. And so he kept, <laughs> he kept every single one of Kennedy's foreign policy people, Rusk at State and McNamara, McGeorge Bundy, uh, the whole lot of them, and Maxwell Taylor, they drove him and he drove with them consciously into the escalation that would, by, this, by the spring of 65, put the boots on the ground. So he inherited 17,000 people, more or less, in Vietnam. When did he begin the escalation, and who prompted him to begin significant amounts of troops? Well, what happened was there was an incident in late July and early August of 1964, which we remember as the Gulf of Tonkin incident, in which um, we were having, we had uh, sort of gotten the South Vietnamese Navy to attack North Vietnamese islands, which were in complete violation of the Geneva Accords. And the Maddox and Turner Joy, two destroyers, were in the South China Sea, the Gulf of Tonkin, sort of supporting this action. When a tiny, tiny North Vietnamese Navy came out to sort of you know, say, don't do this, and they shot a couple of torpedoes, N everything missed. We shot some torpedoes, they missed. And then carrier-based uh, fighter planes uh, you know, disabled or destroyed these guys. But from that, there was uh, sent to Congress this resolution that if anything happened, you know, that was significant, we would do it. And a few days later, some sonar people misinterpreted some signals and thought an attack had happened. And since an attack had been probable, but hadn't happened, uh, Johnson said that it had been probable, so it was likely, and they passed the Gulf of Tonkin, and he retaliated. How many people voted against the Gulf of Tonkin resolution? Nobody in the House of Representatives. Two in the Senate. Morrison. Morrison Groening. Uh, from, okay, so it's two. Yeah. So, okay, so that, but that authority, there was never a um, declaration of war. That was all that, that Johnson ever had. That's all he ever had. And at what point, did, uh, as he's moving toward the reelection effort, um, in, in between 64 and 68, how many people did he have in Vietnam? In, like, it was steadily escalating the presence, but what happened is that he felt he couldn't act decisively in Vietnam until he had been elected in his own right, that he was really a caretaker president, and he did have this domestic agenda. Kennedy, who had been terrible on civil rights, had a kind of late come-to-Jesus moment and had proposed a Civil Rights Act, which Kennedy would have been impossible for Kennedy to get through. Only Lyndon Johnson could have gotten it through, knowing full well what the cost of that 
that Civil Rights Act would be to the Democratic Party in the South, and it is exactly the, what happened. The anti-war movement uh, began in 64, 65, and... You, you've got to say that the anti-war movement is the sort of the merger of a couple of tributaries. One is an American civil rights movement, which is beginning to activate young people in the North, and it's also an internationalist leftist, but not far left, um, anti-nuclear proliferation movement. And so they kind of join when you realize, and you can see there's a wonderful um, poster uh, in the uh, exhibition here in which it's saying, why are we killing these people when we're supposed to have them have an election? So there are people, internationalists, who are hanging on to the fact that the Geneva Accords suggested that there ought to have been an election two years after the separation um, and that this you know, uh, everyone knew that Ho Chi Minh would be elected to that, and it hadn't happened, and, a, and a, a lot of what we were doing was trying to support a regime that was trying to forestall any nationwide uh, so election. So who were the Viet Cong? So the, when Ho Chi Minh began his revolution against the French, he uh, started an army he called the Viet Minh. And then um, by the late 50s, that had sort of, um, with the French gone, it was sort of reassembled through the work of Southern guerrillas and uh, Les One organizing an organization that became the National Liberation Front. And the derogatory term for them was communist traitors to the country of Vietnam or the Viet Cong is how it got uh, abbreviated. And they are the guerrilla fighters in the South that are then augmented later on in the struggle by North Vietnamese regular soldiers. And how many Viet Cong really, did we ever know how many there really were? We have no idea. It's really just, it's um, grasping it at an impossible So uh, the escalation is occurring, and at what point, uh, let's say uh, by 67, 68, Johnson's getting ready to run for re-election. How many troops did we have then? Almost a half a million by that and, time, and over, and we, the, we peaked the, at over a half a million. All the troops were c largely conscripted? Um, yes, uh, there was. There were people who volunteered in the early days of it, and they were um, very much committed to the cause of stopping communism. And this is where we were going to to put the battle flag. And then a draft, which disproportionately in the early years uh, fell on minorities and poor working class people, and uh, that was slowly for political and other good reasons changed. The deferments if you're married, deferments if you're at college changed. So you had to be doing well at college. And then finally it was eliminated for the lottery system that many of us participated in. So the American in. press was somewhat skeptical. There were a number of reporters in New York Times, Washington Post, and so forth. Um, was Johnson upset with that press? And well, initially that press was there, and it was uh, Neil Sheehan and David Halberstam and Malcolm Brown and, and uh, a lot of people, uh, you know, Peter Arnett, a lot of people that we that we know their work, and they went there fervently anti-communist, willing to sort of, you know, be the cheerleaders for this new American effort, this new kind of warfare. And what they found is that the PR reports from Washington and the MACV headquarters, uh, the military command in, in, in Saigon, were totally different from what they were seeing in the field or what the field commanders were telling them, and they started to write about it. And then Johnson said, you know, get on the team or get out. Now, there were things that McNamara had called body counts, I guess it was. They were counting how many bodies we had killed and so forth. How reliable were those numbers? Well, um, it's one of the great tragedies. You know, McNamara was one of those best and brightest. He'd come from the Ford Motor Company, taken a huge pay cut. He was uh, sort of a pioneer in a field of systems analysis. And so he felt that you could quantify everything, that there was a metric that could, could, could make you understand. And so he was asking his commanders in the field uh, for information that they couldn't provide. And they couldn't digest it, and they couldn't figure out uh, what was happening. And so more and more, they fell back on one of those metrics, which was body counts. How much of them did you kill? And pretty soon, the field commanders understood that this is what they wanted to hear. So fire became indiscriminate. Um, you weren't all necessarily had to be confident that that was an enemy combatant. It just had to be somebody that was moving. And, and I think they got inflated. But I, I also know a lot of human beings that were innocent uh, were killed in a rush to, to fill these numbers. Uh, napalm. Why did we use napalm? Napalm had been around since uh, the Second World War, and it's gelatinized gasoline that has the tendency to burn really hard in wood and paper and flesh. 
and we'd used it in Japan, and we'd uh, been causing McNamara uh, to, to say that had we lost the Second World War, that he and Curtis LeMay would have been hung as war criminals uh, by the Japanese. Um, and then the, we had given it to the French. It's a chemical compound called 245T. And it was called Agent Orange because, you know, uh, uh, Agent Orange of the defoliants that we used. And napalm was just something that we just kept using all the time. So Walter Cronkite made a famous visit to Vietnam. In what 68. Did, what did he conclude? Well, he had gone there to cover uh, the Tet Offensive, which had taken everybody by surprise. We should have known a little bit. Lots of stuff was going on, and there was a good deal of intelligence that something was happening, and we kept misreading that intelligence. But needless to say, on January 30th and 31st, the Viet Cong and North Vietnamese in hundreds of places around South Vietnam attacked simultaneously, and it wasn't at American bases as much as it was at big cities. And their idea was that the, they would defeat the Arvin, the Arvin would run, that's the Army of South Vietnam, and that the people chafing under the autocratic rule of whatever regime is there would rise up against it. None of that happened. The, the Americans and the, and the South Vietnamese won in every single one of those battles. But um, Cronkite was present for the most prolonged battle, which took place in the beautiful imperial city of Hue. And uh, it went on for 26 days, I think it was. And it was just terrible. Most of the other fighting ended within two or three days in the other cities, including Saigon. But this was such a horrible thing that Cronkite had realized that we hadn't been told the truth. And he came back and said, you know, we are not going to win this war militarily. We have to, as an honorable people, do that. And is, you know, the famous phrase attributed to Johnson was never said, that if I've lost Cronkite, I've lost the American people. To remind people, when people were watching the evening news in those days, was it 15 minutes or 30 minutes, whatever? It was more often than not 15. It was in that period that it expanded for a couple of the networks to 30 minutes. And the film that they would have from what was going to be an was one or two or three days old? It would be That's correct. We, we like to say it was a living room war. It really wasn't. Uh, there were no live broadcasts. Uh, 60 minutes, you know, uh, CBS would bring back some of their correspondents, like Morley, Morley Safer would watch the Marines burn a village with their Zippo lighters and, and then come and do a, a kind of a white paper report on it. Photographs came back and they were shocking and then the film from the Tet Offensive happened. NBC ran uh, the footage of the great famous photograph of the assassination of the North Vietnamese spy Lem by the head of the National Police Luan on the streets of Saigon in the middle of the heat right. of the uh, thing and it was so graphic. But NBC's footage, which they played only once, uh, is even more so. So Johnson intended to run for re-election then in March of uh, of 68, he said, I'm not going to run. And was that because he really didn't think he'd get the nomination, you believe? I think there were a lot of factors. I think he could have gotten the nomination. I think he would have gotten the nomination uh, had Kennedy, Robert Kennedy, lived. But in November, Eugene McCarthy, a senator from Minnesota, declared that he was running as an anti-war candidate. In the New Hampshire election in which Johnson was favored to win and did win, he didn't win by the two to one margin. He won by only uh, 10 or 12 percentage points, which was enough for uh, the anti-war movement to declare victory against him, even though many of the votes uh, for McCarthy were protest votes from people who wanted Johnson to prosecute the, more, the war more vigorously. I mean, it's, it's crazy stuff. And Robert Kennedy entered the race. And when that happened, I think a whole set of stuff, and Walter Cronkite, and all of these things began to uh, sure. sort of meet, in, and he had his uh, well, On the Republican side, Richard Nixon was running for the nomination, and he said he had a secret plan to end the war in Vietnam. What was that secret plan? He had, didn't have a secret plan to do it. He, uh, really? He, um, he knew, he and his uh, foreign policy advisor, uh, uh, Dr. Henry Kissinger from Harvard, knew that they, this was an unwinnable war, and they knew they had to get out, but they knew they also had a, a tremendous uh, optics problem, we would say today, which is if you go in uh, when you win and accept the terms in January of 69 that the, that the North Vietnamese are offering at the bargaining table in Paris, um, you're the first president that's lost a war. So during the 68 election, uh, Lyndon Johnson, maybe to help uh, the Democratic nominee Hubert Humphrey, is trying to get a bombing halt and a cessation of combat for a while. Uh, what does Richard Nixon do about that? Well, it's very interesting. We don't really know what Johnson's motives are. I think, I think he is uh, taken as surprised by the fact that there seems to be some substantive uh, 
progress in the peace talks. And he announces that at the end of October, just a couple of weeks before the election. And Humphrey, who's been significantly trailing, suddenly just takes off and, and is, is coming up uh, in the poll numbers to equal Richard Nixon. Remember that the, there's a third party candidate, Governor George Wallace of Alabama, uh, also running and siphoning off traditional Democratic voters, uh, in, at least in the South. And um, it's a very complex election. But what Richard Nixon does is that he and the Republican Party reach out through intermediaries to uh, uh, Chu, President Chu of South Vietnam, and say, look, going against what they've told themselves, you'll get a better terms from us. We'll be more hard line than Humphreys. So you should boycott the talks because it was now presumed that the talks would expand and there would be not just the North Vietnamese and the Americans, but the Viet Cong and the South Vietnamese. And there would all be parties to these talks. And Chu announced just on the eve of the election that um, he was going to boycott the talks. And that was a big blow to the peace process. But Johnson had CIA wiretaps and FBI intercepts on phones and cables in the Vietnamese, South Vietnamese embassy in Washington and at the presidential palace in Saigon and understood this. He calls Everett Dirksen, is recorded on tape, and says, Ev, his friend, the Republican senator from Illinois, this is treason. And he goes, I know. Yes, it is. And then Nixon calls in a day or so later saying, you know, I'd never do anything like this to harm the peace process. He was lying. And for some reason, Johnson didn't reveal this. And I've heard from some of the Johnson people, one of the projects we're working on as uh, LBJ's presidency, is um, that Humphrey may have vetoed it, not wanting to win on a kind of false thing uh, okay. and look like a, a poor sport. but. Uh, it's interesting, we tend to separate Nixon between domestic and, and foreign policy, but the Watergate is so completely linked to his terror that somehow the Democrats are going to get a hold. I mean, you can't make this stuff up. It's like the Michael Steele uh, file, you know, the dossier. And he orders, well before Watergate, the firebombing of the Brookings Institution to get at a safe which he thinks possibly contains the incriminating uh, evidence of his interfering right. with the, uh, the oh. South Vietnamese in that first election. 68. So he won the election in 68. By the slimmest of margins, 43.4 to 42.7 percent. And uh, so he has a secret plan, but there really is no secret plan. So how many troops were there, American troops, in Vietnam when Nixon was More elected? than half a million. How many? More than half a million. Half a million. All right, what does he do? Does he increase the number of troops? He, he, he talks about eventually, not right away. He's, it's, it's basically business as usual for a while. And then he talks about um, drawing down the troops and withdrawing because he realized he can blunt the anti-war movement, which is growing in increasing, uh, increasing numbers and also militancy. And if he can isolate and drive a wedge between a vast number of, of folks who are just opposed to the war and those who want militant solutions to it, and he you know, does the, I think, a brilliant and, and smart thing, which was ending the unfair aspects of the draft deferments. So what was Vietnam, into a lot. Vietnamization? That was one of his ideas. What is that? Well, it's, it's an old idea. It was a French idea, which they called Jeannismal, the yellowing of the, the fight. And it, it is based on the most incredibly uh, ill-informed supposition, which is if, you, if the South Vietnamese can't win with half a million Americans, they're not going to win without the Americans. Just as the French thought, well, if we can teach the Vietnamese to fight for themselves, we can get out of here. It's just people trying to avoid cleaning up the mess or staying to finish it off in, in this case, uh, if you're just looking at it in a cold political eye. So Vietnamization was a way of gradually turning over to the South Vietnamese army the principal uh, fighting of, uh, of not only the Viet Cong but the North Vietnamese invaders. Now, uh, during the spring of 70, there is some undisclosed bombing in, I guess, Cambodia. That's correct. So we had always, um, uh, we've always wanted to go into Cambodia. We wanted to go into Laos. We bombed Laos. We, we dropped more bombs on the northeast. And the reason we wanted to do Laos. that because we thought there were supply routes there. And they were. The Ho Chi Minh Trail is not one road. It's not like Fifth Avenue, right? It's like this braided trail of thousands of jungle paths. It's mostly in Laos and, and extends down into Cambodia and then and enters at many points uh, in South Vietnam. And we put more bombs in the Laos portion of the trail than we dropped on Germany and Japan combined by a, 
a multiple and didn't stop the traffic at all. But we also had had a relationship with President, uh, with King Nordam Sihanouk in Cambodia when he was overthrown uh, of a pro-Western guy. Sihanouk kind of played it both sides. And uh, when uh, La, uh, Lan Nol came in, he was pro-Western, and that gave Nixon a chance to do right. what military commanders, which is to get into, start bombing in Cambodia. And when we found out about it, the peace movement was reinvigorated. And what happened at Kent State? Well, there were protests at, at literally hundreds of American campuses, uh, but at Kent State, it, it obviously became the nadir of the protest uh, time, uh, protesters had burned down an old uh, wooden ROTC building, uh, set, set fire to it actually a few days before May 4th, and had prevented the fire department in Kent, Ohio from putting out the blaze. And as a result, Governor Rhodes sent National Guardsmen, basically the same age as the students there, with live ammunition. And at some point, one of the companies was retreating. It was very tense. Some people just walking to classes, not involved. One of the students who was killed was an ROTC student who was just walking by. And they turned and fired on a parking lot. And we still, to this day, don't know entirely how the order was given, why they did it, what they perceived the threat. But four young people, two men and two women, were killed, several injured, one paralyzed for life. And um, it was an overwhelmingly popular event in a polling now, told now, us. Um, towards the 72 election, Nixon's running for re-election. He wants to say that there's some progress. He sends Henry Kissinger out to the press briefing room, which is the first time he was ever allowed to speak in public because of his, his accent. His thick German accent, yes. So they never wanted, they thought he sounded like Dr. Strangelove. So right. they never actually uh, would true. let him, it's true, they never let him speak publicly before. So they sent him out there. What did he say and what was the basis for his statement? Well, he had begun to see that there was a huge appetite on the part of the two North Vietnamese patrons, the Soviet Union and communist China, to just get it taken care of, like stop arguing the small points. And so there had been real progress at the bargaining table and there had been concessions that uh, you know, they would permit the North Vietnamese troops that are already in South Vietnam to remain there, which was the death knell of South Vietnam if you're looking at it from a negotiating standpoint. So he was extremely happy. But what happened was is that the chief North Vietnamese negotiator, uh, Le Doc Tho, was basically conceding points without consulting with his southern brethren, the Viet Cong, and they were unhappy. So all of a sudden the peace talk sort of ground to the halt just at the moment when he was saying everything was going very well. So uh, the Pentagon Papers are released at one point. What were the Pentagon Papers and why was Nixon so upset because it really wasn't about his administration so much. So at one point in the war, I think reflecting his from the beginning anxiety that this wasn't the right thing to do, Robert McNamara had ordered Leslie Gelb, a civilian employee of the Pentagon, and Robert Gard, a military uh, attache, to begin a kind of history project in his closet, as he put it, which was a big room, um, and collect the data going back to the Truman administration of the history of our involvement in Vietnam. And it is this damning portrait of president after president and diplomat after diplomat making the wrong decision and knowing full well uh, that this was not going to work out, but saying the exact opposite to the American people. And they were working with a subcontractor, the RAND Corporation, and on the RAND Corporation staff was an ex-State Department guy named Daniel Ellsberg. who had been in Vietnam, served a year there, had been very gung-ho about the war, but had grown disillusioned with it back at the RAND Corporation. And when he read this report, um, he began with a comrade there named Anthony Russo to copy uh, the, the material. And then, as you know, the rest of the story, uh, Neil Sheehan and the New York Times began to print it. And now, as the celebrated movie The Post did, they joined them. Now, Nixon is reelected uh, overwhelmingly against George McGovern in 1972. Um, how does the Vietnam War begin to wind down? Well, he's already begun to pull out troops. And by the time that he's reelected, there are almost no American combat troops there. And what happens between the time of his reelection and taking office in the second term is a kind of just devolution into a, a civil war, which is without a doubt in anybody's mind is going to end up in a North Vietnam. Ultimately, the peace agreement is signed. And the peace agreement is signed in late January of 73, I think it is. And, it, and we had also done a little smoke and mirrors saying, well, it's not about all the things we said. It's 
it's about, it's about POWs, you know? It's about getting our soldiers back. And as one reporter told, or, or a military person told a reporter, you'd think we came all the way to South Vietnam uh, from the other side of the world to get back our 600 prisoners. And how many, it's not how many we had, 600? About it, and how many. Some there, of them were there for eight or nine years. Well, Everett Alvarez was shot down in early August of 64, and this is the spring of 63, so you can do the math. That's a long time. Uh, and we interviewed Everett for our, our, our thing, and we also followed other POWs, and you know probably the most famous one is John McCain. So um, Nixon leaves office because of Watergate. Gerald Ford becomes president. Uh, what is his uh, role now in trying to end the final? He can't do anything because what has happened is that the will of the American people has changed. Um, to against the war. They may have overwhelmingly reelected Richard Nixon, but the scandal of Watergate is also turning people against the Republican Party and the, and the people who not only believe we should have never gotten into Vietnam, which has been a majority for several years, has now a majority of Americans think we should get out of Vietnam right away, no questions asked. And so their elected representatives in Congress begin to cut off funding. And Ford can argue for sort of emergency funds uh, to keep up military stuff, but it's, it's not gonna happen. And um, eventually, it's just pulling the Americans out. And through the stupidity of the American am ambassador in South Vietnam, many of the options for evacuation are cut off because he refuses to say that Saigon's going to fall. And so we end up getting a fraction of the South Vietnamese people out that we wanted to. So there's the famous helicopter taking off from that the American. That is not the embassy. That is a, one of several collection points throughout Saigon. It's, a, it's an apartment building or a, a, an office building of several stories that has a, a tower on it. It was an appropriate landing zone, not for the big Hueys, but for the smaller mm -hmm. helicopters and the, the line of people. The South out. Vietnamese who supported Americans that didn't get on a helicopter, were they killed? Or what happened there, was, there was a great fear there was going to be a bloodbath, and no doubt, particularly in the countryside, there were many, many thousands of acts of personal retribution uh, within the kind of small communities of which some people would be in support of the government, some people would be neutral, some people would have joined the Viet Cong, and, and, and it was terrible. The Vietnamese that, that took over, the North Vietnamese when they were victorious, now Vietnamese, um, said that you know ordinary soldiers would spend only a few days in re-education camps and officers, it might be a month or so. We interviewed one of our interviewees, a South Vietnamese General T, uh, spent 17 years in a re-education camp. How many Vietnamese actually came to the United States as a result of the war? Um, I think it's uh, over 500,000 came. Uh, there, the millions of people tried to get, not millions, but several million got out of Vietnam, uh, boat people, and went to various places. Many died along the route, tragically. Now, historically, when we fought a war, when the war was over, the American soldiers were honored. We had ticker tape parades for them and so forth. What happened in Vietnam with the soldiers? Well, a lot of it had to do is this is the first time the American people had been by the time the war ended against the war. Um, but I would like to say that it's a much more complicated thing. Um, there were no ticker tape parades of those kinds. Some towns did do that. Some soldiers were welcomed home. Um, but the way the army recruited and deployed and then returned, soldiers was singular. It was everybody came home alone. Everybody went to war alone and came home from war alone, and so there was not the opportunity that we had in previous wars. You mean they wars. flew them over commercial planes or something? Or? Sometimes, uh, chartered commercial planes, but you didn't come home so that your town would do something unless your town was disposed to do something. So the opportunities for that, but you already had a public, and, and the advice, the th I mean, we all hear the uh, this stuff about they spit on me or they did this or whatever, but the, essentially the saddest thing to me is that people said, Go home, grow your hair long, don't take off your uniform, don't say anything. Why was it so controversial to build a memorial to those who died in Vietnam? I think because the war was so contested itself that it became, as we find ourselves incapable of doing today, avoiding the binary responses of politics. There has to be something wrong with whatever you're going to do because the war was so contentious, then a memorial, it a priori would be. Thank you very much for doing this for the country and uh, extraordinary and I've watched it and uh, I'm going to watch it again and again. I hope everybody else does and thank you again for being a great American and producing this. Thank you. Thank you.